Greengage provides e-money accounts for small and medium-sized enterprises, high net worth investors and digital assets firms. They leverage the latest technologies, including blockchain, to unlock new funding and liquidity, a game-changing for many SMEs, which are fundamentally underserved by traditional financial services. As a client of Greengage, you will have a dedicated relationship manager, yes, a real person who will listen. And getting started with Greengage Engage is easy, trust me. I've gone through the process myself and it's been really simple and quick. So, if you are seeking a more personalized experience in managing your accounts in the digital space, I generally encourage you to check out Green Gage. And here is a little bonus for you, my wonderful listeners. Use the code FOX10 when signing up to enjoy a 10% on the first year's fee on corporate accounts only. The link is in the description, so take a moment to explore what Green Gage has to offer. Now, back to the show. Hi, this is Steffi and welcome to The Financial Fox. Today on the show, I have Emmanuel Daniel, a global tough leader in the future of finance, author of the book, The Great Transition, The Personalization of Finance is Here, is the founder of the Asian Bank and also the Wealth and Society. So, what's so wrong with banking? Why banks are collapsing? How the world of banking has been changing over years, decades, and the banking are not keeping up? There is something wrong. And I think uh, Emmanuel has uh, some really good point. This is going to be the first discussion I'm going to have with Emmanuel because I want him to come back next uh, month to discuss more about the banking crisis. But for now, I'm sure you are going to enjoy this very engaging conversation as well. Remember, if you have got any comment or any feedback, you can also add uh, your comment in the comment section of the YouTube channel, or you can reach out directly to me at steffi at financialfox.news. Also, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. Now, let's get into my interview with Emmanuel. Hi, Emmanuel. How are you? Steffi, uh, I'm good. Uh, and greetings from Warsaw in Poland today. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I'm, uh, you know, you, you have got such amazing energy and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So let's uh, start with, I think, uh, like a compelling uh, statement because it's not a question, right? The banking system is in deep crisis. I mean, all the financial system is kind of collapsing. So you have been, uh, um, you wrote different books, you have funded different company, you are, uh, you know, an influencer in uh, the fintech financial market space. So what's going on? Uh, Steffi, you've probably heard, uh, you know, different counts on on the banking crisis that is taking place right now. I mean, I put that in uh, inverted commas, banking crisis, the banking industry has always been in crisis, so there's nothing new. Uh, but let me let me uh, give a perspective uh, from my world. Uh, you know, I'm the founder of the Asian Banker, uh, you know, 28 years ago. Uh, so in all that time, I've visited and uh, I've, I, and among my friends are some of the, the most important uh, banking personalities in the world. Uh, my book, The Great Transition, the, the Personalization of Finance is here. Uh, the, um, the foreword was written by none other than Barney Frank, uh, the congressman who co-authored the Dot Frank act. Um, so, so take it that uh, this is my perspective, that in traditional banking, something that bankers have failed to realize is how the industry has been changing on them slowly. Uh, and that the language of that change also needed to be, um, you know, to, to be reconstructed to capture what's exactly happening to them. Now, the, the current crisis if I were to use um, one element in my book, which I described, the, the first time the world had a banking crisis after the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement, that was in 1971, when President Nixon went you know, on television and said, you know what, the U.S. is no longer going to uh, honor this, uh, uh, the value of the dollar against the price of gold. You know? And from that time, 
It took about 12 years for the first of the banking crises that we know today. Uh, and that was the housing, um, the uh, savings and loan uh, crisis in the US uh, in about 1984. I mean, it was building up over time, but by 1984, it had got to a head. Uh, and, and in fact, some of the people involved in that, uh, the FBIC chairman, at that time, uh, was also my friend after he had retired. Uh, you know, and the, the issue at that time was that the mom and pop banks, the, the main street banks in the US, weren't able to match their assets and liabilities uh, because the price of money uh, started to become, become floated uh, in the global marketplace. So interest rates were all over the place. Uh, and, and also, of course, the Fed was uh, you know, raising interest rates to, uh, to fight inflation and so on. Um, and and uh, mortgages were 30 year long uh, uh, products, um, you know, and the average bank found it difficult uh, to match uh, the, the, the length of their mortgage with the, with the cost of funds. That was the 1984 crisis. Uh, and the big thing about the 1984 crisis, if you were in the banking system, uh, is that the, the mortgage sat on the books of the bank. In other words, when you look at the balance sheet, it actually contained mortgages of real houses, right? Now, then as uh, subsequent crises evolved, uh, in 1987, there was a securities crisis where uh, the banks started dabbling in the securities market. Uh, and when that became unstable, uh, it created a, a, a crisis of its own. And then by the 1990s, uh, it was, um, um, you know, sovereign crisis, the Mexican crisis, the Asian crisis, and so on. Um, and then by the time you get to 2008, the crises had changed. They become more ephemeral. Uh, you're no longer looking at mortgages sitting in the balance sheet of the banks. It's actually derivatives of those mortgages and derivatives of those derivatives. Okay. And all through that process, uh, you know, the, the, the banking industry was becoming ephemeral. It was not based on solid assets anymore. Um, you know, uh, at the same time, it was becoming digitized. Okay. Now, and the banking industry was responding in a structured way that we can actually point to it, which is the Basel agreements. So the Basel one agreement was set aside 8% of your capital to, uh, to make sure that you can, you can survive a bank run uh, and that you can survive liquidity problems. Basel two was, oh, there's a securities element to our business now. So we need to have uh, uh, three pillars, uh, one of which uh, looks at market risk, another is operational risk and so on, right? And, and then Basel III started to uh, allow banks uh, to value their assets uh, in the way that they thought best, uh, which is in, in banking is called uh, the internal ratings um, um, uh, method methodology. So there's advanced and standard in internal ratings methodology. In other words, the regulators were saying, you know, Mr. Banker, I have no idea what you have on your on your on your balance sheet today. Uh, you know, so you need to help me by giving me uh, a valuation based on what you think it is, and then we will, you know, augment that with our own uh, perspective and so on. And in fact, many global banks uh, started cheating on it because. Uh, they started um, uh, identifying uh, their risk-weighted assets in a very conservative manner that, uh, that their risk-weighted assets on their balance sheet was actually very, very small, when in reality it was very, very large. Okay, that's another story in itself. Now, as the industry was being digitized, bankers were in love with the idea of, uh, of digitizing uh, to industrialize their industry because the margins were compressing. So they needed to do everything that they were doing uh, cheaper, better, faster, uh, you know, and, and, um, and, and still be profitable. But digitization and industrialization are two different ideas. They're two different trends. They're two different phenomena. Um, you know, so they thought that when they got into uh, digital banking, for example, and, and instant payments uh, and so on, that, that all they were doing was reducing their costs, but the customers still love them. Uh, you know, but the thing about digitization is that if a bank can digitize, so can any number of players around the banking industry. And one of the first areas that became transformed in the digitization space was payments. You know, so there's a big dichotomy uh, between the payments industry in the US, uh, which is archaic, uh, sitting on a whole range of legacy systems, you know, driven by Visa and MasterCard, that looks like it's being digitized, but at the back end, uh, there are armies of different um, players, intermediaries, uh, making money from uh, any funds transfer, right? And then on the other extreme, you go to Africa today, payments is very simple. 
it's a messaging, it's a message between point A and point B. Uh, and if you can send a text message for free, you can send a payments message for free, you know, and, uh, and they revolutionize payments uh, in uh, Africa today. Now, the current crisis uh, of, you know, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Signature Bank, um, you know, First Republic. Now, these are the first victims of the digitization of the, of the deposits business, um, you know, and, and the bankers thought deposits means that, um, you know, the customer will give us cheap uh, deposits, which we then can deploy into, you know, either lending or invest it back into treasury bonds and all that, which, which they've done. You know, none of these banks were doing the wrong thing. Uh, they were doing what all banks do, um, you know, that is to lend as much as possible. And, and when you get beyond a safety level, uh, you, you just hoard it all in treasury bonds. But then the treasury market acted up against them. In fact, it was the Fed uh, by raising interest rates, you know, uh, caused the banking uh, industry to suffer, um, you know. And it's interesting that um, that the Fed benefits whether it raises or reduces interest rates. Uh, and that's another conversation in itself, right? So now the thing is this, that this trend is going to continue growing, okay? The, now, it's a well-known fact that, uh, that you know, the, the reason the banks couldn't respond fast enough is because payments today is instant. So on, on the day that, that the tweet went out from uh, Peter Thiel, uh, that take out your money from from Silicon Valley Bank. It was by Monday morning. There was like eighty billion dollars worth of funds, uh, you know, transferred. So you know, the bank was sitting on a real big big hole. It was already sitting on a uh, proverbial big hole uh, because the balance sheet wasn't uh, balanced anymore. Uh, but uh, pe when people take out their money. Uh, when the customers take out their money, uh, you know, you, you've got liquidity problem uh, there. You know, so now the thing is that uh, the banks think that that's the only problem that they have. What they don't realize is that the deposit business itself is in transition. And that's why my book is called The Great Transition, right? There's a great transition under, un, you know, that the industry is undergoing right now. Emmanuel, Sorry. tell me about what do you mean by a great transition? Because, so, I mean, from, from your comment, it looks like banks had a function, has always had a function for, you know, people and for businesses. Now, is that is happening they can't keep up? But with, you know, technological changes, with how things are changing now, obviously you mentioned the digitalization. So because they are, they can't keep up, then, then there are different victim, victims like we have seen from the recent uh, collapses. So what is happening now? I mean, you talk about the personalization of finance. What is the banking don't get? Okay. And if and if they don't get there, then they can't fix the problem. And, and, and then we can go also uh, into another topic, which is uh, what is the role of banking? Now, you know, when I was writing my book, uh, I came to the conclusion that in all the innovations that take place today, if the product doesn't change, nothing changes. Okay, so and that applies to any industry. If if you're talking about innovation, uh, it's not just that you're going to do the you know the same things differently. The 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 core product has to change. And then yeah. I looked into the banking industry and I said, which of the banking products is ripe for a change? It took me nearly two years to come to the conclusion that it's the deposit business. Uh, and I and the book was published in September last year, and and you know Silicon Valley happened in March this year. Now what is happening in the deposit business is this: you know banks. In the old days, deposits means that you put money in and you with compounded interest, you can keep up with inflation and, and your money will grow, right? The whole idea of deposit is that you, you're growing your money. But today, with the interest that banks give, a bank deposit is the last place you're going to grow money. Yeah, because, exactly. I mean, right? uh, much better to get somewhere else. I mean, even if you buy a piece of art, probably it's going to hold money more. That's right. And the bankers themselves tell you that. So that's why they, they then tell you, you know, here, by the way, we've got a structured product, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, we provide insurance if you want as well. That's right. You know, now, so the thing is this, that, that, the, that the deposit business has come to its logical end. Uh, and, and what was happening was that because we were becoming more digital in our lifestyles, there was the rise of the digital wallets of all kinds. 
Banks yeah. can set up their own digital wallets. Uh, the super apps can set up their own digital wallets. And there are super apps with digital wallets around the world, okay? In China, in Korea, in, in even in Russia, okay? And in Southeast Asia and in Africa in some places, right? So the, these are super apps that because they provide the transactional service to their customers and because their customers it can start with a ride hailing application, right? If you use ride hailing all the time, there all Starbucks, for goodness sakes, right? You 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 can uh, deposit some of that money in there so that you can uh, use that for your Starbucks purchases uh, if that's part of your lifestyle. So the you, the the function of a deposit business had moved from wealth creation to utility, right? And and in utility, some of these. Um, digital wallets are now taking their users into the metaverse, into into digital realities that, that it is nothing physical. You you absolutely need digital tokens in order to be able to transact in that reality, right? So so you got the whole range from traditional payments, which used to be done in cash, to new uh, digital payments that need to be done uh, only by tokens. So I'm talking about a whole range of digital payments. Now, where is digital payments taking us to? At one extreme extreme digital payments is a link to your bank account and the other extreme digital payments is a uh, is a token uh, that's nothing to do with a bank in other words you and i can transact with each other uh, using a digital token right and and so um, so that whole area is growing comp in compounded ways okay it's like i think the compounded uh, growth of uh, di digital wallets is like 25% or more uh, a year okay it's a few billion dollars. It's nothing like the size of a deposit business, uh, but but the attrition is already taking place, which is banks are struggling to uh, justify why anyone needs to put money in a bank account today, right? Now, so I see in my book that eventually, uh, I see a world where every bank will compete with each other by issuing their own table coin. No, no, wait, wait a second, because, you know, I'm like getting smashed here. I mean, I, OK, I'm with you that the banking industry is uh, OK, is in trouble. Right. Let's use this word. Then you have got all the conversation about CBDCs everywhere. And that's like big things right now everywhere. I mean, in the UK, in Europe, and it looks like they want to get there, right? Let's get the CBDCs. Like we are not already using digital money anyway. And now you're basically telling me that we are going to go even that each bank is going to issue their stable coin. But how that can work? I mean, how that is going to work? And how can you have so many banks? So... And basically, you are saying that most of the bank are going to die because you can't have like mul multiples and multiples stable coins. So where we are today is that digital money has been invented. It exists, right? And within the banking industry, there are many who uh, who wish it away. They, they think that it's um, aberration. It, it, you know, it, it, it is a distraction. It will go away and everything will go back to the banking industry. And just like a genie is out of the bottle, uh, it's not going back in again, okay? It exists. Now, the, the thing is that we are now seeing the iteration of how regulators are trying to deal with the prospects of new forms of money. Uh, and yes, uh, the central banks around the world, and I know many of them personally, by the way. They, I have a question after. They, Go they, you know, and I, there's a love fest, okay, uh, among all the central bankers. And in the central bank world, they meet every year at the Bank for International Settlements in, in Switzerland, right, uh, in Basel. And, and they just love falling over each other uh, when one of them comes up with an idea that, that, that is uh, attractive. Okay, let me ask the question. Are central bank going to buy Bitcoin, put Bitcoin on the balance sheet at some point? Already. Yeah, they, the already. Bank, the BIS, already. BIS has already issued the paper that from 2025, both central Central banks and commercial banks can can hold uh, cryptocurrencies in in their balance sheet. Okay, so the central banks are playing both sides of the of the equation just in case they miss out on something. You know, so uh, and and they've got rules now. You know how much uh, capital you need to have in place, and only two percent of your balance sheet can be uh, cryptocurrencies. But uh, the door has been opened even with the co uh, commercial banking industry. Like, go into the BIS uh, website. And in fact, you should put in the link to that 
to that paper that uh, that um, um, gives the structure for how central banks and commercial banks can issue uh, can can carry uh, crypto on their books. Now the thing is this: uh, there is a lot of experiment taking place on central bank digital currencies. Okay, and I've spoken to the central banks that already issued some CBDCs, uh, and none of them are working. Okay, now the take up is um, is uh, abysmal, um, and even in China, where I spend a lot of my time, um, you know, the only and, and China has got all these. Uh, uh, incredible headlines like, you know, 100 million people uh, using this digital yuan uh, for transactions in this province and so on. All of that are marketing exercises. They are pilots. Uh, and the, the central bank in China is uh, afraid of going fully live with the CBDC project because uh, it's like a solution looking for a problem. Uh, it's like you know, it's a, the solution is that it will disintermediate the traditional banking industry, uh, and then they decide that no, they will they will deploy the the, the CBDCs through the uh, traditional banking industry. You know, when they don't have to, uh, and then it creates other problems of its own, right? So, uh, and and there's a greater expectation being put on the central bank. Uh, by the end user as a result. Okay, that's only one of the problems that they have. They have like easily seventeen to eighteen problems that we can talk about. But you can you could, can they just use stable coin, right? Stable coin pack to the euro, stable coin pack to the dollar. You know, stable coin pack to I their think, own. I think we are getting there. I think we are getting there now. It, for, to some people, they say, "Oh, you know, there's too much regulation against stable coins." Um, and when you think about where stable coins are right now, the issue is not the technology in stable coins. Is the governance structure in stable coins meaning yeah. that that whoever is issuing it can be a trusted um, you know issuer uh, and and that you can audit them you 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 know that they are, they've got reserves against that and the industry that is perfectly suited for the governance of stable coin is the banking industry uh, even in the U S the O C C wants to uh, have oversight over stable coins because to them it's a deposit taking institution okay so um, so the, the 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 parallel with banking industry is very real you know and. And, uh, you know, after rejecting it, after, you know, discussing it and after going around the block with it, I believe uh, that uh, the banking system will eventually come to a point to say that, you know what, uh, I think we're the best issuers of stable coins uh, in any marketplace. Um, just remember I said that, okay? Um, and I'm saying this uh, with full cognizance of the, the first principles of banking, uh, you know, the, 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 the intermediation business, um, you know, uh, and the problems that banks are facing today, which is that they have a, um, a, a reliability problem for the use of money uh, by, their, by their customers. In other words, increasingly customers don't need an intermediary, so they need to redefine their role as a result. It is, it is interesting because you see there is a big problem for people they are dealing with in the cryptocurrency space to get a bank to get somebody that allows them to interact, you know, to move this money, to move this cryptocurrency. Then you have got, you know, private company like Circle, right? Or Tether, they issue stable coin. Then you see banks, you know, like the old fashioned banks, they are all afraid about crypto, right? So who is going to be the winner and who is going to be the loser? I think the, the scenario is shifting now. Uh, because the, in many countries, definitely in Asia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, the regulators have called in the banks and said, you know what, we want you to uh, support the crypto players. We want you to enable them to, to, to make transitions or transactions between fiat and crypto. In, I think in the UK as well, right? So uh, the US is the only market where it is very complicated because every, um, every state has its own regulations. So in some states, you can just set up a crypto bank without, without even consulting the, the local regulators. Uh, and in some states, um, you know, there are specific bans on crypto. So, you know, one of my favorite bank is uh, Canadia Bank in, in Wyoming. And um, the, uh, the lady who set it up, uh, she's amazing. She, she is, um, you know, fighting the system to, to make crypto, um, you know, mainstream. Uh, and, and so the U.S. is, you know, the U.S. is always does all the wrong things until it comes to a conclusion and then it does the right thing. So, you know, there's nothing new. What about is the that. conclusion? I mean, we have already had so many collapses. What's the conclusion? Tell me. The, 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 the collapses had nothing to do with the balance sheet of the banks. The balance sheet of these banks 
what was as good or as bad as any other bank in the U.S. system. The the, the collapses took place uh, because of two reasons. One is uh, the, the the power of perception today that directs the stability of any institution. So yes. in, the, in the old days, an institution or a business can say that we are as good as our inventory is. We are we are as good as our our collectibles. Um, and today, you're only as good as your perception because everything is digital. Yes. Your, your yes. customer can can leave you. Uh, and the second is that the the regulator had uh, acted to shut down these banks, and you must read the uh, the the report that that Bar, the uh, the vice president or vice chairman of the of the Federal Reserve Bank, wrote a paper as to what actually happened. Uh, and the paper was pathetic. It was like an excuse as to why the the Federal Reserve banking system didn't uh, monitor these banks well. Um, and it was not a question of monitoring. It was a question of um, of a sudden bank run uh, that could be uh, instituted instantly, and and that's the that's the challenge that uh, regulators need to think about. You know, the the, the 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 if there are bankers listening into this podcast, right? I'll say this to them: banking is a batch processing industry. Okay, um, at the end of every day, they shut down the the the, the mainframes, and then they have to balance the accounts and then switch it on. So. So being able to give uh, intraday liquidity is a big deal for a bank. Uh, it's like they're doing their customers a f- service a favor. Crypto is a 24-7 um, industry. It's alive and nobody's controlling it. It manages its own uh, liquidity uh, worldwide uh, at all times, right? So the, the, the answers for traditional banking in a digital age, age already exist. Today, it's a functioning system, um, you know, and, and traditional bankers need to take a second look and say, uh, what can we learn from the crypto industry, especially from decentralized finance, uh, and apply it back to our treasury functions, to our, to our own asset liability management. So as, as, as the realization grows, uh, then you will start seeing the banking industry um, embrace um, digitization, not industrialization. So what is going to be the future of banking? Be a little bit like a Nostradamus now, right? Just, um, yeah, tell us what is go- is going to happen in your views in the next uh, 12 months. So the, the issues that I struggle with, issues of intermediation, uh, the role of the intermediary, um, you know, even... In crypto, uh, centralization is still a theme. Uh, it, you you have to be a commercial. It's all centralized. I mean, a part of uh, Bitcoin is all centralized. Even even some uh, you know DeFi project they are all centralized anyway. And uh, and if you, it's almost as if if you're not centralized, you you can't get it off the ground. You can't create scale. You can't create liquidity and so on. Um, so and and the promise of decentralized finance is decentralization. Um, you know. So I think that what is going to happen is that the, the concept of centralization will have to change, uh, except that the role that the players play will be different. And to this effect, I think that some of the actions of the regulators against um, you know the the stable coin players against um, you know Binance and and so on is that uh, it, it, what it's doing is cr- uh, making the decentralized players even more honest uh, by saying that they don't control the transaction to the extent that they do both on the liquidity as well as in the utility of the of the transaction. Um, so this is the, um, I won't be a nostronomous because that's too far ahead. Uh, I would say that let's keep our eye on the things that need to change uh, to understand where this is taking us. So the okay. whole idea of, of decentralization uh, is a work in progress. So what does it need to change? So if I'm a new bank today, or, you know, I want to start a bank or, you know, or whatever can uh, can be some banking function, because the role of banking has changed, right? So what should I think about offering to my cl- my customers? Taffy, that's well, a wonderful question because there is there are hundreds of uh, digital banks around the world and, and the, the one thing that I'll say to them to put their finger on is please swim in as much customer data 
as you can, okay? Uh, because today, what is possible with customer data is nothing uh, in, in, uh, compared to what was possible just two years ago, three years ago. Um, and when I say customer data, the conversation is more important than the institution or the product, okay? Um, now, just take peer-to-peer -peer lending, for example, right? Uh, when peer-to-peer -peer lending started, uh, they, they, they thought they were going to disrupt banking that you now, you know, you, uh, borrowers and lenders can ma meet each other on their platforms. Um, the, the asset doesn't even get on anyone's balance sheet, uh, you know, and they match players together. And then in the US, what's happened today? Everyone, SoFi and, and all the others, have applied to become banks, right? And the reason is that in the early iteration of peer-to-peer uh, -peer platforms, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer platform players um, uh, constructed the idea of the product in the same language as the banks. That means that they were facilitating mortgages. They were facilitating lending. And, uh, and they were facilitating that on, on a set of very limited information that was not very different from the information that the banks had on the customers. And then they, they even... Um, you know, defaulted back into credit bureau information and so on. And that's because the regulators forced them to do that. When in actual fact, they have all kinds of amazing information on the borrower and the lender, right? And if they facilitate platforms uh, where borrowers and, borrowers and lenders talk more with each other, their AI will be able to identify new product propositions in the future. Yeah, so I, my astronomer's um, prediction is that we will see a revival of the peer-to-peer -peer platforms in the age of AI uh, and intensive data um, you know, analysis. Okay, listen, Emmanuel, it was a brilliant conversation. I want to stop here because I want to get you back on the channel again. And I want to talk about, again, the future of banking with AI and much more that we can discuss. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, anybody that would like to read your book or, you know, would like to, ch I mean, chat to you or, you know, anyway, know what you're doing, where should I go? EmmanuelDaniel.com, my name, uh, .com, that's my blog page. Uh, and then from there, it takes you to everything else I do, the business that I run, the, the book. And, and then also sometimes I put out comments on, on the blog, uh, on some of these things that we just talked about. Fantastic. Emmanuel, it was great to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Steffi.